What's going on, everybody? It's me, your buddy Rich. Welcome to another episode of BTC 2.0. We're going to talk about comics. We're going to talk about fun stuff. But first, we're going to talk to Tom Scholey. Tom Scholey is the uh, writer, artist of Jack Kirby, the epic life of the king of comics. Uh, we got him on the show to talk about his book, his influences, his passions, his love of comics. Guess what? If you're watching this, you love comics. I love comics. This is great. Um, we get to talk about all things Jack Kirby, just art in general, his work in general, and it's a fun conversation, guys. Check it out. Hey, hey guys. Welcome Tom Scholey to the show. Tom, how you doing? Uh, good. How about yourself? I can't complain. It's beautiful outside. Uh, you're in Pittsburgh, so East Coast weather is finally picking up, right? Gorgeous. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, let's just jump into it, man. Like You've been... You've been in the comic business, I want to say, 20 plus years or almost 20 years? Yeah, 20 plus. I, I think I started like 99 or 2000, okay. around there. Yeah. And, you know, like, that's a long tenure to be in any kind of business or like any kind of job, you know? Sure, yeah, that's a full career. People are usually looking at like their second careers, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, so... What was the moment, and you're, and you're not an older guy, you know, like you're, a, you're relatively like a younger dude, you know? So yeah. like, what was the moment that made you say, hey, you know what, I can do this? Um, I mean, it, it, it was like just meeting other people who made comics, you know, it was kind of seeing that, okay, it's, it's like human beings that do this stuff and, mm -hmm. and like on all kinds of levels, like, like, just going in the local comics shop and seeing, you know, um, like handmade zines by local creators that, you know, selling their own consignment, like that kind of blew my mind. I'm like, wow, you can do that. So that, that, that was, that was it. That was, you know, it's like, okay, I can do this. Almost like a little kind of like inside baseball or like getting into show business where you're like, oh my God, like this is attainable, right? Yeah. Because you do just, I, I mean, I have this tendency to think of these, uh, you know, these characters and these things as just kind of like coming out of nowhere, just kind of, you know, like, like Superman, you know? Yeah. I think that also, that could be a generational thing because, you know, we were, Superman was already a thing, you know, like when we were born, you know? So yeah. it's like, it's like that spark was like already there for like a couple of generations, you know? Yeah. I, I can only imagine what it was like for, you know, that sort of like first generation of comics creators where they're kind of seeing it all happen in real time, which is like, you know, part of Kirby's story. Like he was part of that first wave, but you know, he, he, he didn't make the very first comic book. So he, you know, he was kind of there like as it's happening. Yeah. Like I really, I really enjoyed that part of the book. Um, Jack Kirby, the Epic life of the King of comics, uh, where it's showing his influences of, you know what? I took this from the pulps. I'm going to borrow this idea and do this idea and then kind of make my own thing. Uh, and that's fascinating because I feel like obviously now in 2021, that's how you get new ideas, you know? Yeah. And, and that like the, the, like this new media kind of, you know, look, they kind of build off of older media. They kind of, you know, in the beginning before they kind of find their own voice and figure out like what, you know, what this new medium you know, can, can say that no other medium could before, but yeah. And, and Kirby talked about like, you know, he, he's like, I wasn't like, I meet comics fans and comics collectors and comics obsessives. I'm not that, but I was a pulp fan, a pulp collector, a pulp obsessive. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, it's kind of like the same uh, personality type or the same behavior, just mm -hmm. it's, it's like, this is what the, you know, this is what the 1940s version of it is. This is what the 1980s version of it is. Yeah, it's like the par the fan the parallels of fandom. I think yes. you know, where like I think even now, like I'm I've always been like big into comics, but then I'll meet somebody who's like, you know, I don't like comics, but like I'm a big fan of sci-fi. Like I can't read enough sci-fi novels, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting how like you didn't go back and forth, you know? Yeah, because they are sort of siblings, you know, mm -hmm. sci-fi comic books. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. So, um, it's it's pretty insane how. I think I want to say 85% of what we enjoy now and consume is thanks to like a Jack Kirby. Um, yeah. Doing this book to me seemed like a really insurmountable task, you know, because it's, it's a big book 
and there's a lot of detail in it. How did you go about doing the research and all that other stuff that kind of goes along with it? Because like I said, it's very detailed and very well done. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the research like largely grew out of just the sort of um, just my like my fandom of Kirby, just like mm-hmm. years and years of being kind of obsessed with his work and wanting to learn about him and, and you know, how he made what he made and what his story was. And then sort of falling down that rabbit hole. Like I, mm-hmm. I'd spent, you know, like you said, I've been doing doing it for around 20 years. And so I've been, you know, reading about Kirby and obsessing over Kirby for mm-hmm. longer than that. So that kind of, that built this like really strong foundation. And then when it came time to like actually start making the comic, it was like, okay, I know that, you know, this happened in in this decade and this happened in this year. And I know that, you know, you know, you know, him, uh, you know, working at Marvel, you know, a couple different times and and Mm. being a couple different, like I, I, I knew, I knew the story. And so it just became a matter of, um, you know, fine tuning it. So, and, and, I just sort of started, I approached it in chronological order, um, but then I also did sort of like a larger, I made sort of like a rough, larger roadmap of like bullet points. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, this, this is what Kirby, Kirby's life looks like. And then when I started actually making the comic page by page, then I would go in and be like, okay, now am I sure that this was, you know, what happened here? And then I'd go mm-hmm. and, I, and I, I'd check and I, you know, you know, see what I could find, see what I could dig up. And then sometimes it would, you know, like it would be like, oh, I thought this happened before this, but it's looking like, you know, it actually, you know, something else happened in between them, you know, so it, it was, it was kind of like that. And then refining that larger map as I went along too, kind of like mm-hmm. taking another look at that, that big roadmap and, and adjusting to like the things I was learning. So it's, it's almost like when you're like loading up, uh, like, it, like in the old days of computers loading up a photo at first, you see like this, like really like blurry version of it and it starts uh-huh. getting like, it was kind of like that. That's a, that's a very interesting. That's also a very interesting analogy. I've been having uh, conversations with people about generational technology like that, where it's like I remember uh, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I remember calling my now wife on a payphone when we started dating. Mm-hmm. You know, like stuff stuff like that's kind of interesting. Um, did you? I, I feel like I already know the answer to this one. Did you grow up a comic book fan? Well, I, I grew up a superhero fan. We didn't have a lot of comic books in the house. Like my dad uh, wasn't like a lot of people inherit like their dad's collection or like an older siblings. Mm-hmm. And like my dad was not like a fan. Like he loved Superman in the 50s growing up. But he said every time he like as soon as he would finish reading an issue of Superman, he'd like rip it up and throw it away. <laughs> so there was like there was, yeah. he didn't he didn't he wasn't like a comic fan beyond just like childhood. So there weren't a lot of, but I loved superheroes. I was like obsessed with superheroes. I loved, you know, all the, the um, 1950s Superman TV show. I loved all the oh, cartoons, yeah. friends, uh, you know, Spider-Man. So I was, I just, you know, loved superheroes. And then comic books, you know, when I started, um, you know, getting a little older um, and, and kind of being able to spend my pocket money on things, I, I you know, was going to, to comic books to kind of like fill in the gaps in my superhero knowledge. Like I wanted mm-hmm. to learn you know, more about this, this, you know, world of superheroes. And it seemed like that, that was like where the real inside information was. That's fascinating too. I feel like, uh, I'm, I agree with that hundred percent. I feel like that's kind of the way I, I, I was always into comics, but then just, I wanted to read pretty much everything that I can get a hold of, regardless if it was good or bad. I just wanted to see what the origins of like all this stuff was, you know? And I think something like that probably gets a little more difficult now, whereas like in the eighties, you know, like comics, I, Comics had like that little bit of a lull, you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and mm-hmm. um, I, I was always fascinated if like I'd find out about a superhero I never heard of. Because I like assumed like, okay, I, I pretty much know every superhero there is. I knew mm-hmm. DC, I knew the, the Marvel. But then when there'd be somebody like, you know, Dr. Solar, Man of the Atom, it's like, who is yeah. that? Like, I- yeah, for sure. That's that. I, I remember, I think it was early 90s when you when we got reintroduced to solar man of the atom magnus robot fighter and these were i think i was in the same boat where I, these were characters i never heard of mm-hmm. yeah and, and it was like before the 90s like reboots it would be like you'd be in in like a secondhand bookshop or something mm-hmm. be some like weird looking comics in the corner like the whitman or the gold key or the dell or whatever and, and yeah it would be so or space family robinson 
Yeah. Um, that, that stuff I always find extremely fascinating too. Like I used to years and years ago when I, I worked at like a really nice retail store and we used to get those old books in, I would, I would spend so much time like at the store when it wasn't busy, just like reading all this stuff, you know, and kind of, there's so yeah. many parallels and, and interesting intersections between kind of like the foundation of silver age comics within that realm of the golden age too, you know, where, and, yeah. and like, I think, I think the book, uh, you do such a great job pointing that out in this book where it's like, you know, these guys have thousands of ideas, but you don't know what's going to stick and what's going to be popular. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, you're trying everything and you, and you, you, like, I know for Kirby, he didn't want to be like married to any one trend or any one genre. Mm -hmm. And he sort of see, like, he'd seen the pulps kind of come and go and he'd seen, mm -hmm you know, uh, you know, the rise and fall of the Western and different. So, so he knew you had to like diversify. Right. So right. he kept like, and then as like fans of his work, you know, you're kind of like, Oh, I wish you would have done more of this or more of that. But like, he had to just keep moving and, and, um, and like superheroes became kind of like a comfort spot for him because he could kind of, he could kind of bring in his, his own sort of like personal power fantasies that mm -hmm. grew out like his, his violent childhood and his, his, um, you know, trauma in, in war, but then also they kind of, kind of combined his, his like interest in science fiction and, and you know, in the future and mm -hmm. utopia and dystopia. Yeah. Well, one of, like, speaking of, of the trauma in war, um, there's one scene in particular that kind of stood out for me was, I think it was like page 60, uh, where he shoots the German soldier and all the photos fly out of his helmet. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now, was that was that a true story? Because I'm like yeah. reading it, I'm like, wow, this is nuts, you know? Yeah. No, his his story, his war stories are like, you know, uh, truth is stranger than fiction. Like this, this mm -hmm. is a story that he told um, in an interview. I think it might have been one of the ones that we actually have like a video record okay. of. Okay. Like story. He 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 told a number of war stories like that. That was kind of his go to thing, and people who were close to him, you know, friends of the family and family mm -hmm. members would get regaled with war stories all the time. And, and to the point where, you know, Roz would, be, would say, Roz Kirby, his wife would kind of say like, okay, that's enough, you know, you're boring <laughs> these kids, you know, they, they don't want to hear this stuff. But, you know, most most people were kind of fascinated to hear these. So that these were, these are ones that are like on the record. Um, and, and that's, you know, all the, all the war stories in there are, are ones that are like on, on the record. They, they are pretty out there, but, but these, are, these are his, his true stories. It's trippy, you know, when you think about it. And I think a few pages later, there was the the bloody sketch that he tore yeah. up. I think that was like page 65. Um, as far as like the book itself, um, very deliberate. I do like how you didn't really stray away from that six panel uh, yeah. like page, you know, so like what what made you decide to do that in particular? Yeah, I mean, it, I, I played around with different possibilities, but that one, I mean, the, the six panels that's like that's like the kirby grid like that's mm -hmm. when you like most of kirby's comics are in that format and that that is like the format he kind of got comfortable with um and it just it just lent itself well to just kind of like keeping the story moving and mm -hmm. and uh, you know making each moment kind of kind of equal i also i like the shape of it too because yeah. it's like square but then when you put in like word balloons and captions and things, it kind of like your image area becomes more like, like a kind of like a movie screen or, you know, like a kind of like a widescreen kind of thing. It just, yeah, it just, it just kind of clicked. I, I, I did think about other approaches. Mm -hmm. um, he like Kirby kind of like he matured into the six panel grid. And I think, I think he used it for a lot of the same reasons too, that it kind of, mm -hmm. it, it makes the, um, the panel like almost invisible, you know, it kind of becomes, uh, you know, it's just like a vehicle for like what's in it. But yeah, like early, if you look at his work, like his early, early, early stuff is like all this crazy diagonal panels and inset. Yeah. And then his like, his final work is, he kind of goes back to that. It's, it's an mm -hmm. interesting like bookend. Um, I, I considered doing that in my comp, like having his early stuff, you know, look, you know look that way and, and then the later part of his life have it like return to that but it just but it's it's very distracting like it's it's kind of good for like a sensationalistic um you know pt barnum kind of like uh -huh. fan kind of story but uh you know it, it 
uh, it didn't, you know, it didn't quite fit even, even for Kirby's explosive light. Right. Right. Uh, I, I think the, the thing I, I, I enjoy about it aesthetically too, is that, you know, like you mentioned, it's, it's kind of cinematic where the panels are windows into certain scenes that you kind of forget about them. But I feel like it also lends itself to like, I equated it to towards the end of Kirby's life when he was doing animation, you know, and it, that six, those six panels lend itself to that, like a style of animation or like a storyboard style. Yeah. It, yeah. They definitely look that way. There's, I mean, like you could get like real like geeky about it too, but there's also like, <laughs> these like eight panel ones where you get like really like widescreen kind of stuff. And yeah, there's, there's lots of things you get like very close to storyboards. Um, so there's a quote on your Wikipedia. I tried to do my research. I'm not okay, that good. Yeah. I'm not that good at it, but you know, <laughs> uh, uh, it says I'm working. This is from you. I'm working in the Kirby tradition. No one else's art does for me what Kirby does. Everything else yeah. looks limp and flat by comparison. He found a new way of doing things. I want to follow his lead. I think he found a way of drawing that is the optimal the optimal way of drawing for a sci-fi comic book epic storytelling. Yeah. It doesn't need to be correct or accurate, just cool looking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Tom. I'm sorry. Well, uh, well uh, no, I mean, that's, I, I think that, I think I said that like a long time ago. I think that's a pretty <laughs> old, but um, like, I, I, I think I'd stand by. <laughs> like it sounds, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah, just like, um, yeah, it, it does like, like, like he figured it out and, and um, that just his like philosophy, like you could, you could, like, I really love the particulars of his style, mm -hmm. all the little wiggles and, and the way he designs uh, technology and architecture, like it's just, it's just really satisfying and like really tap into something like I, I love the, the, just the surface of it. But, um, you know, you can take the foundations of it, you can like strip away the surface and take like, just his like way of thinking mm -hmm. and, and you know like it's it, it's 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 a really good way to go and and uh you know it, like you can make something that doesn't really look like jack kirby but it but you know if you try to maybe think like him you, you can you know get there yeah I, I i agree with the sentiment completely i i feel like that's how part of the show is because like i kind of want to share my own positivity towards comic books and yeah. i do love the fact like that 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 end of that quote really did it for me where it doesn't have to be accurate or perfect it just has to be cool looking you know and i think yeah. the kirby technology stuff has never really been really replicated in a comic you know like like reading like old like silver age fantastic fours like that one to 101 there's some stuff in there that's completely mind-boggling you know that i don't think a lot of artists either care to do that or can think outside the box in that regard you know they're kind of like some of them are almost like MC Escher things. Like they, yeah. they have this amazing depth and and they're very convincing, but then they kind of like can't exist in real life. It, it yeah, it is very singular. And those are some of the elements that like people who imitate him, like myself, that's kind of the, the stuff they get kind of most absorbed in. Mm -hmm. And and it is part like it, it's it um it can be counterproductive for a narrative. You know, like mm. like not handled correctly, and I think that's kind of like a like a pitfall for a lot of people. But he he just he made it like uh, you know just like an integral part of his of his storytelling that that you know it just it just worked. Like I I, I think a lot of people enjoy studying Kirby's work because there aren't like easy answers. Like you know you can you you can study it and study it and still mm. not quite like why does this work? This works so beautifully. And, and like nothing I've ever seen, like, why does it work? Which is probably like one of the things that sort of saved his legacy, I think, mm -hmm. is that his like very best work is like so hard to duplicate and so strange and, and weird um, that, that it hasn't been like done to death. Like he, he has like some of his work is um, like, I, I think more like, you know, some of the Fantastic Four issues and some of the Thor issues, um, they, they have like a very like polished look that has been emulated a lot and kind of became what we call like the Marvel style and, and to the point where it kind of, um, you know, muddies the waters a little bit, but those like really like the really out there stuff, like the, the new gods and the Eternals, uh -huh. you know, we still haven't caught up with that. Yeah, that's it. That's such an interesting statement too. Cause you know, like I, I, I'm still a regular comic book buyer. 
you know? So the shop I go to, I'll always check out their silver age stuff or their bronze age stuff and specifically a lot of their Kirby stuff. And I, and I'm, I'm sure the same way, like if you pick up like Eternals or any of the new God stuff, you can just kind of stare at it for hours without reading the book. Yeah. And, and in the beginning of my sort of comics collecting, I didn't have that many comics. So I would kind of have to, I'd have to savor them just because this is all the comics I have. So, you know, those, those like early comics that you have, have kind of like an echo chamber effect <laughs> like you, where now, like you kind of, you read a comic and you forget it because you, you move on to the next, you know, you know, we have access to so much now. Yeah. I think that like that also specifically with the advent of digital comics, you know, like it's, it, it's, you don't, which are great. It's fine. Um, but you don't get that tactile feel to it, mm -hmm. you know, specifically yeah. like, you know, like some, some of the older books have that, like that greediness to them, you know, that they were something from before your time almost, you know? And it's like, for me personally, as much as I love, like looking at stuff when it's cleaned up, like single issues will always do it for me. Um, that being said, like what, what's your Kirby collection look like? That's, I mean, it's pretty extensive. I mean, I, you know, it's um, my, my, the holes in my collection are like, you know, fifties, forties, you know, like, like that kind of stuff. I'll, I have a lot of this stuff in like, you know, reprints and things like what's available. Um, you know, you know what I would really love. I mean um, the, his like Captain America run, like I have them all in uh, uh, the Marvel masterworks. Yeah. You know, but I would love, like, I would love to have like a, you know, like a, you know, really good scans mm -hmm. of that entire run with like all the pulp, like, I, and, and, you know, I, I feel like the, the reprints where they just basically take a really nice photograph of an old mm -hmm. comic, print that those are like the best, that's the best quality reprint you're going to get. Yeah. And, you know, like it's, and, and the glimpses I've seen, like this, the photos that I've seen of like the actual printed copies of Captain America, they look so incredible. And, and, and the masterworks just, they, they, they pale a little. I, I know like there's, um, I think Folio Society is putting out this like deluxe Captain America package. And like one of the things, it's like $125, but one of the things is like a replica of Captain America number one. And it looks like that's what they did. Like they, they did, you know, so it's like that one yeah. issue and you can get, you know, wow. like, a, like a kind of pulpy, uh, uh, zip -a -tone dot kind of, you know, version of with, with like the off register color. Yeah. I gotta, I gotta look that up. That sounds awesome. I, I, I love stuff like that, you know, just like either seeing the, seeing the book itself or getting like those really nice reprinted editions. Um, so in creating this book, clearly you're a fan, you know, you're, you're in the industry. Was there stuff in the book that you didn't know until you put everything together? Yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of like little things. Yeah. And, and, and it is like, you know, some of it, so just some of the, the personal stuff for Kirby, um, you know, or, or, or things that like, maybe I forgot, maybe I knew at one point and just forgot, but I like a, a real simple, like a real quick one was just like, you know, I, I, I knew Jack Kirby did, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, I want to say night of oh, blue beetle. He did blue, he worked on blue beetle for a little, but I, and I knew that was like very early in his career. I didn't realize that that was his very first superhero. Oh, wow. And so when I do the chronology and like, okay, what happens mm -hmm. next? In Jack Kirby's like, it's like, wait a second, this is, this is the first superhero comic ever and it's blue beetle. Like that kind of blew my mind. It's like, you don't really think of like when you think of Blue Beetle, if you think of a an artist or a creator, you would think of like Steve Ditko, I think, you know. Yeah, yeah. More than anybody. Um, but yeah, would, like that was that was the first thing Kirby worked on. Kirby didn't create him. He was kind of like this um, you know, this like uh, created by a, an artist named Charles Nicholas, which mm -hmm. um I, I I need to check, but I think it, it might be a pseudonym. And I think it might be one of those pseudonyms that's like shared. By number. And, and so when Kirby yeah. did his, I think he might have done his under, under the name of Charles Nicholas, uh, too. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, like uh, the one thing that really, another going by uh, stuff you didn't know or whatever, uh, page 96, the meeting with the FBI, I found that fascinating, you know? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, that was one that I, I 
you know had had known about like there, there's certain like sort of like famous Kirby stories and that's oh. yeah that's one that he, he claims that that the FBI came to visit him uh when he was working on um uh sky masters uh mm -hmm. and the space force that that like they were like how do you know this stuff like like his stuff was like too close it was hitting too close to home it was in the, the ships and the spaceships and, and engines and stuff he was working on were like way too credible and and so they thought maybe he was you know i don't, I don't know what they thought maybe that he was uh, somehow giving information you know but but they they you know came and checked it out and had a nice little visit with them and you know figured out he was harmless you know yeah that's got to be wild you know to just be like no man i use my imagination that's <laughs> like this comes from up here like i'm not an engineer you know and we think of him as like having this like really out there imagination that's like 20 years ahead 40 years ahead 50 years ahead um and it, for sky masters he kind of like reeled it in a little bit it's like he's like okay i want to make something that's like convincing i want to make something that's like tomorrow it's not it's not you know 20 years from now it's tomorrow. and and um you know we don't we don't see too much of that in kirby's work you know mm -hmm. he's usually so far into the future but he was trying to make something that was like credible and 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 in some cases he was like right on the money yeah um so how long did it take for you to put all this together and then get it printed and get the deal with you this is from penguin right penguin random house yeah and get yeah, like uh, the deal with penguin uh, random house and, and 10 speed which like they're owned by penguin random house but like i yeah. dealt with like like 10 speed um I, you know I'm, I'm kind of like losing track exactly because it, it had sort of been in kind of like a rough form for like a really long time and then but it was like it was like around it was either i think it was maybe like his hundredth birthday or or mm -hmm. i think maybe his hundredth birth his hundredth birthday was kind of like coming up and i was like okay if somebody was gonna do a jack kirby life story they would have certainly done it in time for for the uh you know the hundredth anniversary so mm -hmm. it looks like nobody's going to do it nobody's going to do like a comic book of jack kirby's life so it's it's time like like in fact it's it's yeah. past like i should have started this and then <laughs> had it to come out on his hundredth birthday but his hundredth birthday so like i uh, and i think I, I think i have the year right i think it's either his hundred or his hundred first or something but it was like okay I, I need to just do this i need to just kind of put uh -huh. everything outside and do this and so I just started a page at a time. I did a page, posted it on, on Instagram, on mm. Twitter, on, you know, just uh, on my website and just like a page at a time, you know, start, started posting it and, 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 you know, getting this thing done. And that, I mean, you can get like lost in your sort of like pre-production mode for years and years and years. It really oh, yeah. is. You just, yeah. You, you just gotta like buckle down mm. and be like, I'm doing it. I, I, I know I would rather have, you know, 10 more years to, to think about it, but it's like, it's now or never, I got to do it. So then, and once I started doing that, it kind of took on its own, its own momentum. And then once I had like 60 or so pages done, then I started sort of like shopping it around and mm -hmm. you know, seeing if it's interested. And, and then that's, that's when like the deal with, with 10 speed came about. How's the, how have the, the sales been for the book? Because uh, I remember when, my local store got this. They sold out immediately. I think they ordered maybe like 10 or 15 copies and they just like went, you know? Yeah. I mean, as far as I know, it's like, it's, it's, you know, like the most successful thing I've ever done. Uh, I don't like have the numbers for like some of the, not, you know, the non creator owned work I do, but yeah. like, it, it seems like it to me, like, it's like, you know, from where I'm sitting, it looks like it's, it's, uh, you know, doing better than anything else, but I don't know, maybe, maybe like the transformers or something, maybe they sold, you know more copies of that but i wouldn't i wouldn't know like i'm not right I'm right not but it seems it seems like it's going really well so would you uh you know considering that the book came out last year um yeah is this one of those things that you could see yourself kind of going back to if you got more information at some point to say you know what i can throw in like at least another 20 pages onto this yeah i mean i i'd love to do a i mean you know it's kind of hard doing a book like this because uh, like I was saying about like, oh, you could take another 20 years if you think like, uh, I, I feel like I could tell and retell and expand on and do different formats and different versions of the Jack Kirby story. You know, there were like a, a bunch of different like ways I had envisioned this thing. And this is like one of them, but like, I don't, I don't, like, I don't know if that, you know, if, if that's a thing, you know, that, you know, how many, 
Jack Kirby books does, does the world want from me? <laughs> you know, like maybe it's like somebody else's turn. But yeah, I mean, I like it's it's been a while since I finished it. It's been it's been I think like um, like a year since I finished it, and mm. it's like I I I could like and I was when I finished it, I was all Jack Kirby out. Like I had put every like I'd squeezed every ounce of like Jack Kirby uh energy out of myself and it was on the page the page but now it's kind of like rebuilt itself so like i i would totally do like another jack kirby book and and you know maybe take a totally different angle on it or or um i mean the, the one thing i was thinking was that um i i wished i had the freedom like of fiction like i wish i could tell the essence of jack kirby's story as I understand it and as I, but like not be confined to the facts. Like that would be a really fun book to make, but then that would be something that, that you know, then I'd have to like change his name or, to, you know, like, and, and other people have done that. Like Howard Chaikin has a book like that. And um, Rick Beach has a book like that. Mm -hmm. And it seems like so much fun and like so much creative opportunity, but it's like, I didn't like, I, you know, I feel like, you know, that's, that's something different. You know? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it, it's also, you kind of answered like one of the follow-up questions I wanted to have where it was, um, you must be, you must have been so burnt out by the time this got published that you're probably like, I don't want to see any Kirby stuff at least for a couple of months. Yeah, I mean, I, I just like, you know, uh, I, I needed a break. Like, I, and I took a month off. I was like, I'm just going to take a month off. I'm going to mm. do nothing. And then it was, and then, you know, COVID happened and everything happened. So that like oh, became like a year. Extended a year vacation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, I, I bounced back pretty quickly. Like I, I, I couldn't see myself making, you know, like going more into the, into the world of like Jack Kirby, the person, but I, it, I, I was still mm -hmm. excited and interested in his work and working on this book. Like I, you know, I, draw Jack Kirby drawing some like crazy like sci-fi escapist story mm -hmm. and I started getting kind of jealous I'm like I'm like I'm because it's 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 a different it's very difficult doing non-fiction you know it's, it's yeah. very disciplined and you have to kind of hold back a lot um and, and be very like rigorous and careful and like I just wanted to have that kind of fun that Jack was having you know on the as I'm drawing him and so when I finished this, that's like all I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was like escapist, sci-fi, heroes, monsters. And it's pretty much what I've been doing since. Like okay. I've been just kind of like messing around, doing like web comics and things and stuff on my Patreon. Mm -hmm. And it's all just pure escapism. It's all, you know, glorious nonsense. Uh, what's, what are the, what are some of the things that you're working on now? Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've actually been pretty busy and done a bunch of them, but it's like um, the, the one I just, put out a, a version of it. it's called uh, dragonzo the zombie dragon it sounds great <laughs> you know and I, I did um i did uh a thing called um a truth to power which is like this like superhero thing i did uh, cosmic man which was like this superhero character that i made up when i was a kid uh -huh. and then i kind of, you know made like new adventures from because i was kind of thinking like i get such a charge out of working on like existing properties because mm -hmm. they're algae tied up and stuff and i thought like how do i get that with like a creator and thing so i thought like oh that it would be like that because it's like mm -hmm. i have this nostalgia for this character i made when i was like, so that kind of fueled it a little bit like like it meant a little more to me than if it were you know some character i was making up now yeah and you did you did uh go bots too right you did like a like a, yeah, i want to say like a like a resurgence of go bots for idw yeah that was uh, go bots was like I, what i did right before this right before okay. the jack I did gobots and then i did the jack kirby book and while i was doing the jack kirby book i did fantastic four grand design and and that was like that's that's been like the past i don't know however many years it was just like kind of like this non-stop you know block of time with like you know two hours of sleep and and and, and then the past years i've uh, uh, been uh getting a lot of sleep you know and oh yeah sort of <laughs> uh so what what like what is your if you're really working on a book, like what's your day-to-day -day work style like? Like how many hours do you put in? Um, 
I, I usually like I usually start at night and um, like around around nine and then I'll stay up till like uh, five in the morning or so. So I'll, I'll get like get like eight hours, you know, like a solid eight hours, mm -hmm. which I think like Jack Kirby's schedule, you know, as time went on, kind of got very nocturnal like uh -huh. that, too. So you could sort of take take care of business, you know, you know, when you needed to and then have like sort of kind of like peace and quiet and be in that kind of like dream space and because it does like um you know sometimes i'll wake up the next morning and completely forget what i was working on because you do get into this dream world that's like very uh conducive for creation it, it like kind of takes away a lot of the inhibitions like when you're working on something in the light of day uh it's really easy to be very like self-critical and kind of like mm -hmm. tense up but, you know but you kind of relax at night I, I hear you. I think for, for me personally, I always think about stuff like that too. Um, do you think it, it it's from like, well, you know what? I'm up. Everybody's asleep. There are no cars on the road. Let me get to work. As opposed during the daytime, it's kind of hard to put that cacophony of everything out of your head. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's kind of counterproductive. Like it, it is, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's magic time. It's dream time. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever meet Kirby? I never did. Uh, he he died before I was kind of like really aware of who he was. Like I, okay. I had this like general idea of him among you know like he's he's one of the Marvel guys. You know you, you know I kind of yeah. held him as part as like as like any, any of those guys. I didn't because I just didn't know. And then mm -hmm. it was like maybe like ninety three or ninety four. I started figuring out who he was, mm -hmm. and he was already you know he was already gone by then. I, I would have loved to have met him. And, Anytime I, I talk to somebody who did meet him, I'm always like, oh, well, you know what, you know, I, I'm pumping them for details. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. Um, did you did you uh, have a any kind of interaction with the Kirby estate while doing this? Um, I not while I was doing this. I mean, I've, I've talked to them in the past, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and stuff. But no, I didn't. I, I, I sort of, you know, I, I, I kind of decided like to kind of not. Uh, not get involved with it. like kind of like you know give them the space and let, like i'm sure they have like their jack kirby related projects that they want to do and kind of like you know leave them to do theirs and this is kind of like from the perspective of like you know like 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 a lifelong fan mm -hmm. you know scholar and then like i mean i would love to see you know the family produce some kind of like real like you know at home with Jack Kirby, like real, uh, you know, the Kirby we don't know. And I, 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 I do uh, see like, um, like his his family members. They will occasionally there'll, there'll be some like photo that they'll put out that like no one has ever seen before mm -hmm. or something. Like, you know, here's you know here's here's you know some some uh, you know World War Two era photo of Jack, or you know here's uh, you know his you know this like you know, his his anniversary party or like mm -hmm. all these like very personal family things and, and and of course like i'm always like really you know curious and interested so so they're sort of you know telling his his story you know their way yeah i think his uh i think his grandson posts a lot of that stuff you know like yeah. the, the behind the scenes like at home yeah. or like posting pictures of his desk and all that you know yeah he puts together these like packages he puts together these kind of like pdfs and then mm -hmm. also these physical packages of different you know you know, Kirby, you know, relics, you know, <laughs> you know holy relics. Uh, if you could, cast, we'll do a couple more questions and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, if you could cast a Jack Kirby biopic, who would, who would be in it? Yeah. Um, oh man, that's a great, uh, that's a great question. Uh, Kirby. Yeah. He, I mean, there's, uh, man, that's rough. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm on the spot because <laughs> I do have answers for this. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking. Uh, let me, let me give you, I'll give you mine, and then yeah, give it'll give you a couple, of, a couple of seconds to ruminate. Um, in my head, in my head, I always pictured Mark Maron as Stanley. Yeah, right. Danny McBride as Jack Kirby. Oh, you know, you know, that Danny McBride is. I mean, I like him in everything. Uh, I, I remembered who, who I like. I, I can't remember his name, but he played. Hirschberg in um, Inglorious Bastards. He played. He, he he's in Inglorious Bastards. There's a soldier, and they say, "Hey, hey, Hirschberg." And when I saw it, I thought they were saying, "Hey, Kurtzberg." And okay. I was like, oh, 
that's Jack Kirby. Tarantino's a huge comics fan, worked in a comic store, you know, and that he put Jack Kirby in this movie. He said Kirksburg. Uh, and then like, you know, later on checking the credits, so I realized it was Hirschberg, but the actor looks like young Jack Kirby. And he, the guy from Freaks he, and Geeks. The, yeah, from Freaks and Geeks, yes. exactly. Okay. I don't know his name either. He, I always blank on his name. <laughs> he would be an amazing Jack Kirby. Like he would be my pick to play Jack okay. Kirby in the, in, the, in the Jack Kirby uh, movie. And like, yeah, so then you just like age him up. Cause, cause like your, your mind tends to go towards like, okay, who's a great middle-aged character actor? Uh -huh. It's like, we all, Jack Kirby is like perpetually middle-aged, but I think it would be better to get like a young guy who you can, you can like age up. Yeah, Mark Maron, uh, another one I've heard for Stan Lee is um, uh, Walter White. Uh, what's his name uh, from uh, Breaking Bad? Brian Cranston, yeah. Right, that's another one like I've heard people throw around for, that, for Stan Lee. That would be a very intense Stan Lee, I think. <laughs> Yeah, judging from his resume, I think it would be it would work. Obviously, I think, but like it would it would be a very intense Stanley. I think that would be yeah. like the, uh, you know that that version of Stanley that everybody loves to hate. You know, uh -huh. right? Yeah, it's, it's two different movies. It's almost like when they would make like two different Truman Capote movies. Right, right. You know, or like two two different Liberace movies at, at, the, at the same time. You know, it's like yeah, you, you get two different flavors of Stan. Maybe they could do like a. Uh, like the the Bob Dylan thing and have like multiple actors play uh Stan and Jack. That would be a lot of fun. Um <laughs> Tom, uh we're gonna wrap it up in a minute. What is the sandwich of your dreams? The sandwich of my dreams. Um I like corned beef, uh uh some chorizo, oh, some, yeah. uh, like uh, Swiss cheese, uh you know, uh some 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 kind of like flavored, some kind of mayonnaise with maybe some like peppers or something in it. That sounds and, fantastic. And some, get, some, get some lettuce on there. You got to have your greens. That sounds awesome. Uh, where yeah. can everybody find you, Tom? Um, you can find me on, uh, you can follow me. You can check out my Patreon. Uh, just search Tom Scholey on, on patreon.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Tom Scholey. Uh, you can check out my, um, my YouTube show, to, uh, Total Recall Show on YouTube. Um, and my Instagram, Tom underscore Scholey. Very cool, man. Listen, thank you so much for coming by. Uh, I had a great time. I hope you did too. Yeah, this was fun, Rich. Cool, man. Guys, I can't thank Tom enough for coming on the show. What a great guest. I think we had a fun time. I'm pretty sure he had a good time. I think he may have said he had a good time. I'm not sure, but I think he did. Uh, we got plenty of guests coming up uh, on the show. Next week, we got Elliot Kalen, and then we got Phil Hester. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, so onward and upward did you guys check out mortal Kombat? i did guess what it rocked i feel like not to name names but i do feel like a lot of folks out there need a little bit more rock and roll energy in their life you know and what i mean by that is get yourself a six-pack get a couple of buddies get some friends watch a movie together it may not be the best movie not everything is citizen kane you know but maybe things could be citizen cage if you know what I mean. Uh, I watched the movie with my brother and my wife. Fantastic. We had a great time. We had some Mexican food. We watched this insane fight flick, and it was a lot of fun. Um, speaking of a lot of fun, they just released the trailer for Jeff Lemire's Sweet Tooth, which is coming out on Netflix later this year. I'm very excited for it. I feel like they should turn this dude's properties into like anything imaginable. Plutonia. Black Hammer, I think, got picked up. Uh, even his, listen, his run on Moon Knight, if that got turned into something, oof, I'd do a backflip. Uh, a lot of fun stuff coming out. A lot of fun stuff coming up now that the world's starting to open up near Comic-Con. Uh, it looks like it's happening, uh, although it might be a limited capacity. We'll see what happens. Uh, I know there's a lot of New Yorkers out there. There's a, like a billion trillion New Yorkers. Maybe not all of them get vaccinated. Who knows? But let's see what happens. I hope the uh, convention scene comes back strong and safe, uh, you know, especially in the city because it's my city. It might be your city, too. That's, that's pretty cool. Uh, my books of the week this week are Berserker number 2, Keanu Reeves, Matt Kent, a lot of other people worked on this book to bring you this awesome piece of barbarian goodness from Boom. Uh, I loved it. I liked issue number one. I liked issue number two. Uh, part of me does feel like it might be better in like a trade format instead of monthly. And I'm very rare when it comes to that, like personally, you know, like I, I those sentiments coming from me, I'm a weekly book buyer. I buy comics and single issues. Uh, it's very rare that I would get a trade of something. Usually if I'm, 
if I missed a few issues or if I'm backed up, I'll just end up picking up the trades. That's what happened with Invincible. That's what happened with Deadly Class. You know, I'm like, oh, I missed a bunch of issues. I don't know where to find them in my own personal boxes because it's kind of a mess sometimes. Uh, and I end up buying the trades, which is fine. You know, like I kind of feel like my 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 collector anxiety is making me pick up books every week because I don't want to miss what's going on. But some books just leave you wanting more. And I feel like a collected edition of Berserker would be awesome. I'll probably end up getting it when it comes out anyway. Uh, and also Beta Ray Bill number two. What a book. I talked about rock and roll before. What a rocking comic. It might be the most rocking comic on the shelf right now. Uh, pretty much this and Ultra Mega are probably the most rock and roll books on the shelf right now. And what do I mean by that? Fun action doesn't take itself too seriously really well thought out you're getting a lot of cool stuff in uh beta ray 2 beta ray is on the search for his new hammer you know he is stuck in his horse form and the way uh daniel warren johnson friend of the show big shout out the way he takes this art in this issue is amazing it's more of the same stuff you'd expect kicked up to 11 uh doing it for beta ray bill yo he does and Okada Rainmaker in one of the panels. I'm super stoked about where the series is going to go. Uh, and I think, you know, I would love more Marvel books to have this kind of looseness from creators. You know, like I feel like sometimes, you know, mainstream comics get a little stagnant because, you know, you have to kind of go by the book, quote unquote. But something like this is still refreshing in mainstream books. Uh, and regardless of what you like, pick up comics every week. Pick up your comics, indie comics major uh, publisher comics. It doesn't matter. It's all love. And that being said, I will see you next week with Elliot Kalen. Talk to you soon, guys. Love you. Mwah.